Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series of lessons is a series for the months of July, August, and September of 2015. It's entitled Biblical Missionaries. Who would you name as a biblical missionary? Would it be Jonah? We have already talked about him. Esther, that was an interesting one. But this time we're going to talk about some ways in which Jesus reached out across other culture, or across two other cultures. Can you think of some examples of that? Well, while you're thinking about it, let's, let's bow our heads and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us in our discussion. Our wonderful Father, you know how much we need to become more like you. How much we need to learn the lessons of Scripture, the lessons from the Old Testament and the New Testament, and especially about you and how you lived your life and how you reached out to others. May we learn those lessons so that your, coming may, your second coming may be soon, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. What are the most effective ways for reaching out to people across cultural and linguistic barriers? Sign language? Sign language. Sometimes we have to go with the sign language. Well, there are six examples that we're going to talk about in this lesson, which Jesus reached across cultural and linguistic barriers to touch the lives of people who needed him. Let's see what we can learn from those examples. Just as a general principle, first of all, look at Matthew 4, verse 15. And this is a prophecy that was given about the birth of Jesus. It says, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, and now those are a large part of the territory of Galilee. On the road to the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee, land of the Gentiles. The people who live in darkness will see a great light. On those who live in the dark land of death, the light will shine. So we're talking about Jesus, did Jesus live in the land of Gentiles? In the King James Version, it calls it Galilee of the Gentiles. Why would they say that? Wasn't Galilee primarily a Jewish territory? I'm not sure. Samaria up and around there? Well, Judea was in the, in the south, right. Samaria was in the middle, and Galilee right. was in the north. Well, in wasn't, Palestine. Well, wasn't there a, a Roman outpost or stronghold or, or A couple of miles city? from Nazareth, yes. Yeah, something like that. So yeah. I think they would have had some influence. Wouldn't they, wouldn't they, it would seem to me that they would consider anything a Gentile culture that wasn't predominantly Jewish. Right. Yeah. From their, from their own cultural. Or maybe not, not even purely Jewish. Mm -hmm. You have some of this terrible influence mixed in with your pure Judaism. Okay? I would think that might be a very extreme, because they always had, even when they came out of Egypt, you know, they had the mixed multitude. There was always an opportunity within their, within their culture and their, and their, their, their theological structure to bring Gentiles in and and they could become Jewish, I suppose, or, or Israel. Jesus talked Israelites. about that. He said, you, you travel over land and sea to convert people and you make them twice as much a son of the devil as when, they, when you first found them. That wasn't too uh, encouraging a message, was it? I don't remember too many stories in the Bible of the Jews really reaching out to the Gentiles. Mm. You don't remember too many of those. Other than Yeah, well Jonah, it was Jonah and Abraham. He wasn't happy about others. what he was sent to do. <laughs> yeah. They basically kept away from those. Well let me ask people. you a question. There was a city of Sepphoris that was being built, at least partially in the days of Jesus. Do you think Jesus ever did any carpentry work for some Romans? If you uh, I'm gonna yeah. ride this bicycle again, if you look at some of the history he had to have gone someplace else to get work where he was raised 
it was a small village. There wasn't enough work there to support him and his yeah, father. Probably not. They had to move out on a daily basis, sometimes longer. Okay, well, the first major story we're going to focus on is the story of Jesus and his visit to Sychar and the woman at the well near Samaria, in Samaria. What do we know about that story? Well, let me just briefly mention, for whatever reason, we don't know. Normally, the Jews would travel from Jerusalem down to Jericho, cross the Jordan, travel up through Perea, and then cross the Jordan again to get into Galilee to avoid going to Samaria. But wasn't Perea really Gentile territory too? Yes. It just but wasn't were, the were, hated Samaritans. Right. But if you wanted to get to from Judea to Galilee quickly, you went through some mountain passes, and right in the middle of one of those mountain passes, just as there's a break, there's this little town of Sychar. And Jesus and his disciples, apparently for whatever reason, were in a hurry to get to Galilee. So here it is, it's hot, it's the middle of the day. They've been walking probably a lot of miles already that morning. And Jesus sits down at the well and the disciples go into town to see if they can get some food. And what do we know about the story from then on? There's a woman a, came to the well. There's a lady who comes out to get some water. And why was she the only woman out there at that point in time? She, no. she was not uh, socially acceptable. Yeah. So she chose to come to the well at a time when other women were not coming to the well. That is, in the middle of the heat of the day. Okay? And why wasn't she wanting to come when is, everybody is else there any, Is there any information that says that, that that's the reason, or we conclude that, or maybe she just ran out of water? Well, we do know that there are certain times that, that women, women tend to get, to get water first thing in the morning, and then usually maybe in the evening just before dinner time. That's the standard. I mean, you live in Africa, it's still like that. Uh, that's the pretty standard stuff. So you don't normally go in the middle of the day because you've th you got other things to do, and it's hot. Okay? So, and, and what does Jesus do? He said, woman, you sinner, let me tell you what you need to know. Right? No, he asked for a favor. Asked, he asked Give me some water. for a favor. Uh, that's an interesting approach. Why did he do that? Well... It's, it's interesting for several things. For one thing, he's Jewish and she's Samaritan, and mm -hmm. ne'er the twain shall meet. Okay. So there's a, a particular significance in that. Well, but I, I ask the question, why did he ask a favor from her? Well, first of all, it's probably to start a conversation. In that part of the world, <laughs> to refuse to give somebody water was like the worst possible sin. It's still pretty much that way in that part of the world. If someone asks for water, if you, 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 no matter, if, even a worst enemy, you would, you would give them water. Jesus used it as an opportunity to strike up a conversation, didn't he? Yeah. That's what he wanted to do. Did he get his water? No. We don't know whether he ever took advantage, <laughs> <laughs> whether he ever took advantage of the fact that she left her pot sitting there, maybe that time late, but not during the conversation he didn't. Okay, so what happened next? Yes, Dennis. Well, I have a question. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if you have a moment to pursue okay. it. Um, there are two general schools of thought, as I understand, that, that I have friends that believe that Jesus could perform his miracles because he was divine. And there's another school of thought that he could perform, his, perform the miracles he did because he was human but had such a uh, perfect communication with the Father that that he asked the Father to perform the miracles. Yes. Now, there's a subtle difference there. There's a very important indifference. Okay. Now, if you read these stories, and this is one of them, in which Jesus knows the woman yeah. before he speaks to her. Yeah, you know, background. Uh, he visits, uh, dines with the Pharisees, and they think something and he picks up a tete-a-tete uh, -tete argument right, right, right there. With their thoughts. With their thoughts. Mm -hmm. Now, is that divine, or, or can we expect to be able to read thoughts of others if we... Uh, I, I am of the opinion 
and you don't not, not all, not, a lot of people are not going to agree with me on this one. I'm of the opinion that Jesus spent his prayer time at night discussing with the Father and the Holy Spirit exactly what's going to happen to him the next day. And he's prepared when he goes out in the morning for exactly what's going to happen. He knows. So not, be, not, not because of his own divinity, but because of his communication with God. So, in other words, he might have had the night before, um, during this communication, kind of a vision uh, that he's going to run into this lady, I assume. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, and, and there are lots of reasons why I, I say that. One of the most important one is that on the cross, if, if we accept the words of Ellen White, he's, it says that his loss of communication with the Father was, he felt it so, so awful that his physical pain was hardly felt. When he couldn't reach out and touch the Father, when he couldn't be in intimate contact with him, it, it, it was worse than death to him. Another well, thing in support of that is that just before selecting the disciples, he spent the night in prayer. Luke 6, the whole night praying about it. Yeah. yeah. Now, how is but that going to be a, a, the death of a sinner if the sinner doesn't really want to touch God? Well, and I, I wish I had time to explain all that. God is going to provide a panoramic vision of, of everything, the whole story of the great controversy from beginning to end. And everyone at the end of that, it says, Philippians 2, even Satan is going to be down on his knees saying, yes, Jesus, you did it exactly right. And they are going to wish that, in fact, they were on God's side, but they know they're, they're not fit to be on God's side. But I don't have time to go through that whole discussion. Where did the Samaritans come from? Just very briefly in background. Shalmaneser IV invaded uh, Israel what, about 120 years before um, uh, before Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah, and uh, he took off a lot, uh, took out a lot of the community out, made them slaves in Egypt and elsewhere, and he brought in other foreigners uh, to populate uh, the countryside. Mm -hmm. And so, what we ended up with, we, what we end up with, and an actual fact, they believed in those days that gods were assigned to certain territory. So he actually, after a little while, he actually sent out to say, please bring some of the priests of the Jews back so you can teach these people I brought in here, these pagan people, teach them how to worship this, the God of this place correctly. Very interesting situation. So okay. the, the, Mer the Samaritans were kind of a mixed, a mixed race. A mixed race. <clears throat> kind of a mixed race. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and, and they, had, they also had some, some different theological I, Concepts, uh, yeah, and they they were they were ongoing. Well, starting from the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, they were more or less at war with the Jews, and finally, down coming approach to the time of Jesus, one of the Maccabees went up there and just wiped out their temple and everything was like this. They weren't too much too happy about the Jews. So, so, so the story of the Good Samaritan was kind of. Uh, that wasn't exactly what they were looking for, was No, it, it wasn't. <laughs> now, they didn't want to be like a Samaritan. Now, we're, we're emphasizing here um, Jesus, um, Jesus' work on this earth with, um, with different cultures. Mm -hmm. But really, these were not different cultures to Jesus. They were all Jesus' children. Well, but it's still across, he's, he's, as a human being, he's reaching across limbi, linguistic and cultural barriers. So let, let's get down to that part of the story. What happened that, that turned this conversation around? He kind of caught her off guard when he spoke to her right there. To, what did he say? He had to collect the thoughts. Go get your husband. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's the point at which it really... <laughs> sort of shook things up, wasn't it? He said, I'm not married. And he said, yes, that's correct. You've had <laughs> several. Why, why would he say, go get your husband? Why do you think he would say that? Well, I mean, there's it overt and covert. Yeah. 
it was a way of him demonstrating the fact that he knew everything about her. Well, I know, but it was also, it was a improper for him to be there without yeah. her yeah. husband and so well, therefore this is, you need to go get your husband. This is, a, this is a Jewish custom. Now he's in Gentile territory. Well, he's in, he's in Samaritan territory. He's not in Jewish territory. Jewish territory, you're not supposed, in, in those times at least, you are not supposed to speak to a woman that was not a member of your family outside of the home. Never. But this was not Jewish territory. And he did this because, and what did the woman say after, you know, and then he said, you know, I'm the Messiah. She said, well, we know that this, the Messiah is coming. I'm the Messiah. And what did she go and tell the people in town? Could this be the Messiah? Well, Come but before, before that, she said something else. Come and see. He knows everything. everything. Yes. Come and see someone who told me everything I ever did. You know, I hadn't thought about this before, but... Um, we discussed that this woman was basically a, a woman of ill repute in that yeah. the story seems to. Um, the fact that she was that way, the fact that she was rather liberal with her relationships to with men, was that an opportunity here? Would a regular female who was not of this ilk was the fact, I guess what I'm saying was the fact that she was this way gave him an opportunity to send a message into the, into, into Samaria. Possibly. Because if it had been any other virtuous woman, she probably would have fled. Well, she would be there with a whole lot of other women. And Jesus would have had to make a group conversation. And he wouldn't be able to have revealed, hopefully, some scandalous stuff about mm -hmm. her background. She didn't go and tell the town, I don't think, about her background, but I suspect they had some pretty good ideas about her background. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus said, come and, and when she said to her, the people in town, come and see someone who told me everything I ever did, they thought, wow. You know. Well, we, need to, we have other stories we need to talk about. In the town of Capernaum, and this is Matthew 8, 5 to 13, and Luke 7, 1 to 10, if you want to put those two stories together. And there's a very interesting ex expansion on those stories in Desire of Ages, page 315 to 318. Jesus had adopted the city of Capernaum as his home instead of Nazareth when they tried to kill him. After he, well, even before they tried to kill him. And probably he stayed with Peter when he was in Capernaum. Um, and in that town, there was a centurion. What do we know about that centurion? He, he thought and acted favorably towards the Jewish people, yeah. the Jewish religion. Yeah, exactly. He had uh, donated, uh, paid for, or somehow participated in the construction of a synagogue. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay. So he felt like, he, he, did, he felt comfortable approaching the Jewish leader saying, my Jewish servant here is seriously ill. I'm afraid he's going to die. Can you please people? Of course, he... I'm sure he'd heard about Jesus. And so what is he saying? The only one I know around here who has any chance of help, helping my servant is this Jesus. Could, I don't know what the relationship is, is between you and this Jesus, but could you please get him for me? Please ask him to help us. And what, ha what happened? I mean, he seems to be, I mean, we, we, we could understand that he's going up the chain of command. Or, you know, the, the, the rabbis of the mm -hmm. synagogue, you know, would, would be the people who would be the closest to, one would assume, the closest to yeah. Jesus. Exactly. Uh, that he's the one that uh, uh, they would have the most influence with him. Mm -hmm. Well, something happened there. What was it? Remember that in, you have to put the Matthew story and the Luke story together, and or otherwise you have to read Desire of Ages, which puts it together nicely for you. He said, uh, imagine this. He said, I'm a Roman centurion. But he didn't even feel comfortable coming into the presence of Jesus. You can imagine that. He's of the conquering nation. Well, also, is it, is it, is it also possible that he knew Jesus was Jewish? Of course. 
and therefore the Jews were not supposed to mix with Gentiles, and he was a Gentile, so he knew that he was he was being careful to to respect that. He didn't want to put Jesus into an awkward situation. Right. So he was being politically correct. Huh? Yes. And so he told these people, and so as soon as they informed Jesus, Jesus starts coming toward his house. And then what happened? Remember? They informed him that Jesus was coming. He thought, oh no, I don't dare have him in my house. He, Jews, good Jews aren't supposed to be in a Gentile's house. So finally he leaves home, leaves his sick servant. He goes rushing out to Jesus. I don't even think I'm worthy to, to appear in your presence. But I have someone sick at home. You think you could help him? And Jesus' response was, Must have surprised him. The centurion must have been surprised that Jesus was heading that way, coming to his home. Yeah. But the centurion seems to realize that Jesus did not even have to come to his home. Mm -hmm. And he expresses that. Uh, <coughs> even even the, 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 the woman with the bleeding problem, you know, she said, if I can go to Jesus and just touch the hem of his garment, mm -hmm. I'll be healed. But she was to go to him. Now, this man is saying, he doesn't even need to come. Oh, He's, but think about this. This is an amazing thing. Yes. It, it, for a Roman centurion, he said, I have these people who are under my command, and I tell one, go, and da-da-da-da. But what he's saying is that Jesus is in command of unseen forces. Centurion. And he can tell them Come and be, heal, heal, my, heal my servant. He's different to what you read about the run-of-the-mill centurions. They yeah. took what they wanted, when they wanted, yeah. how they wanted, and he paused and, and handled it totally foreign to what a lot of them did. Yeah. His servant was Jewish? Is yes. That, yeah. 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 And, of course, he was healed. And Jesus said, Come I on. have never seen so, faith like this. That's right. Let's go to the next story because our time is, is going on. Jesus is traveling in southern Galilee. For whatever reason, the Bible doesn't tell us, he told his disciples, take me across Galilee. I mean, I, I, this is a bunch of fishermen, and Jesus the carpenter is saying, take me across Galilee. I don't know what, he, why, what explanation he gave, he just said, take me there. And what happened on the other side? Attacked by one or two demon-possessed men. Yeah. He's barely got out of the boat, and the disciples are probably trying to tie up the boat, and here comes these demon-possessed men. And the disciples are ready to jump back in the boat and get out of there. And Jesus says, stop. Okay. And, and of course... There, yeah. there are two... Is this, are there two instances like this? There's one where... Jesus calms the sea, and then they isn't there, and then they. That's a different occasion than what we're talking about. Okay, here. Right. yeah. So there are two two stories here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, um, and Jesus, you know, we know the story. He he has this mob of demons in these people, and he casts them out and into the pigs, and the pigs run down and drown in the Sea of Galilee. And I always wondered how long it was before the Jews were willing to eat anything that came out of the Sea of Galilee <laughs> after all those 2,000 pigs in the Sea of Galilee. Have a no-fish diet for a while. Huh? No-fish diet, something, I don't know. Well, were the farmers Jewish? That yes, thing? they were. Well, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, well, Ellen White not. says that, well, in, in fact, I think I've got the quotation here. But the purposes of Christ were not thwarted. This is from and I quote from Great Controversy, page 515. You wouldn't expect that to be the place where you'd find this story. But the purposes of Christ were not thwarted. He allowed the evil spirits to destroy the herd of swine as a rebuke to those Jews who were raising these unclean beasts for the sake of gain. Had not Christ restrained the demons, they would have plunged into the sea not only the swine, but also their keepers and owners. The preservation of both the keepers and the owners was due alone to his power mercifully exercised for their deliverance. 
Furthermore, this event was permitted to take place that the disciples might witness the cruel power of Satan upon both man and beast. The Savior desired his followers to have a knowledge of the foe whom they were to meet, that they might not be deceived and overcome by his devices. It was also his will that the people of that region should behold his power to break the bondage of Satan and release his captives. And though Jesus himself departed, the men so marvelously delivered remain to declare the mercy of their benefactor. Great Controversy 515, paragraph 1. That is, they were left as missionaries. The first yeah. Gentile missionaries that we know about. <coughs> demon-possessed, uh, how many would you like to nominate a demon-possessed person or just recently ex-demon-possessed to be the first missionary? But practically no training. Practically no training. Well, but they make... Uh, <clears throat> the fact that they were so um, totally in such terrible, terrible straits yeah. makes them a tremendous uh, public relations. Uh. I see. <laughs> to say it a little differently, they had a story to tell. Mm -hmm. They were totally they had exactly a testimony to share, and enough people knew about them and how bad they were and so forth to see the change. Mm -hmm. These people said. Wow. And the next time Jesus showed up in that territory, what happened? Thousands of people flocked out to hear, to see him and hear what he had to say. Even though they, at that point in time, they said, please leave. In a similar way, it's a, a different structure, but in a similar way, it's, it's kind of like Jonah after he was yeah. tossed into the sea and swallowed by the fish and everything. When he got to Nineveh, <clears throat> the story that he had to tell and, and the people who had preceded him there told this story. So it was... Um, what, what, you think it was the people who preceded him? What, what kind of evidence did Jonah produce about that story, do you think? I don't want to get buried in the story of Jonah, but you think his skin looked different because he'd been in the belly of a fish for a lot of time? Seaweed in his ear or something? You know, <laughs> Hydrochloric acid burns in his skin? I think that's been documented, hasn't it? There's been similar instances, I read somewhere along those lines. There have been instances yes. where, where people have been swallowed by whales. Yes, and their skin color changed. And they, and they, now that I'm not sure about the skin, maybe, yeah. You think it was bleached, bleached out and wrinkled? Or? Okay, so Jesus now has gone across the Sea of Galilee had an encounter with the demon-possessed man, goes back. A little while later, after being basically rejected in Galilee, he takes his disciples and he heads for where? Remember? It's Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon. What kind of territory is that? Heathen. Heathen, Gentile. Heathen Gentile. pagan. And where is he headed when he goes up there? He's headed for a woman, looking for a woman. What do we know about the woman? Canaanite. From the ancient Canaanite mm -hmm. tribes of people that were supposed to have been wiped out by Joshua and his friends way back when. Yeah. So what happens as he finds this Canaanite woman? This conversation always amazes me. Mm -hmm. that, that Jesus would speak to her like the record suggests that he did. Well, he responds, El White says, he speaks to her as he knew the disciples expected a Jewish person to speak to such a woman. So he, he plays the Jew first. You know, I can't, I can't waste my time. You're just a, you know, nobody, whatever. A dog, a dog. A dog. Yeah. And what does she say? She you, wouldn't give up. Even the dogs get scraps. Mm-hmm. And then I have this quotation, once again from Ellen White, the Savior is satisfied at that point. He has tested her faith in him. By his dealings with her, he has shown that she who has, who has been regarded as an outcast from Israel is no longer an alien, but a child in God's household. As a child, it is her privilege to share in the Father's gifts. Christ now grants her request and finishes the lesson to the disciples. Why does Zarb he... ages 401 and 402. Why does he have to test her faith? Doesn't he know what her faith is? Oh, 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 wait, 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 hold on. <laughs> why, why is he left Galilee now? 
Remember the, actually we did this last time, but um, in our last week's lesson, this is a period of retirement. He is taking six months out just to <clears throat> try to educate his disciples. So now in light of that, what's he doing here? Well, is he, is he testing her faith or their faith? He's testing her faith, but using it as a way to teach his disciples. An object lesson. Yeah. To broaden their uh, horizon. Yes. Why, why does he need to test her, f her, f her faith? I mean, he would know what her faith is. He would know if she had faith or not, I would assume. Well, Dennis mentioned a moment ago how he's sort of shocked every time he reads this conversation. I hope the disciples were so shocked by what happened that they would never forget it. And that's, I think, exactly what he had in mind. I hope so. Well, later Jesus travels back down, and, and he, he's not traveling broadly in Galilee, but he's traveling along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And he runs into a group of ten men, and who are they? This is Luke 17, 11 to 19. A dreaded skin disease. A dreaded skin disease. We, we, sometimes, we typically translate that as leprosy. We don't know that it was leprosy, but they were outcasts, weren't they? Both from Samaritan society and from Jewish society. Now, if you, by some miracle, manage to get healed from leprosy, what are you supposed to do? Go to the high priest and get cleared. I'm going to read it to you. Leviticus 14. Give me just a second, and I can make it a little easier for you to read it. There we go. The Lord gave Moses the following regulations about the ritual purification of a person cured of a dreaded skin disease. On the day he is to be pronounced clean, he, must, he shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall take him outside the camp and examine him. If the disease is healed, the priest shall order two ritually clean birds to be brought, and da-da-da. So, what do you have to do to be re-established re in society or to be re-accepted in society? Declared clean by the priest. In other words, you now have permission to offer sacrifices at the temple, right? Mm -hmm. So, what happened with these ten men? They took off to go take care of that. And they took off to go take care of that. <clears throat> and what happened then? one of them was different than the other nine. Couldn't it be argued he didn't have to go take care of that? Well, that's one of the questions I would have asked. And did he think it was necessary for him to go to a Jewish priest to be declared clean? He's Samaritan. It, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I'm, but he's Samaritan. He didn't need to go to a Jewish priest to be declared clean. Well, but what did the man do? Well, he, the story says he came back and thanked Thank Jesus. Christ, yeah. Yes. And Jesus made a point of mentioning the fact that he was what? Samaritan. Well, it's interesting to notice in this story that they knew Jesus, they called him by name and asked specifically what they wanted him to do for them. How did that all happen? This is a story that is that is so big. As this man's come through the community and he goes around and he he raises people from death. Mm -hmm. He heals the dreaded skin disease. He heals the blind. Um, think about what it would be like to live just a, a hundred years ago or a couple hundred years ago. What do we know about medicine? By today's standards, we knew absolutely nothing. Yeah. Uh, what they have 2,000 years ago. I mean, if, if you were injured, if you got a disease, you lived with it. And now here's a guy that comes along. Yeah, he died with it. Yeah. Here's a guy that comes along, and he just speaks to uh, uh, these people or touches them or uh, whatever, and, and they're healed. This is, this is the story of a lifetime. Yeah. Uh, it, it is, uh, it, it's, it's gone through the community uh, faster than gossip. Uh, 
we talked about the Roman centurion. I'm sure the Romans, uh, uh, you know, questioning a, a Jew now and then would would be asking, you know, who who is this guy we're hearing about? What's what's he mm -hmm. what's he up to? Everybody, everybody well, knew about him. There, there's places in 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 the Gospels where it says people came to see him from Lebanon, from Syria, from the areas east of the Jordan, from from way down south. They flocked to see him from all over the place. Yeah, so the message got around. Oh, Bush Telegraph. Yeah, Bush Telegraph, yeah. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. very good. Well, um, has God done any things for us that we need to thank him for? Every day. Every day, yeah. Well, another story, John 12, and I'm going to read this one. John 12, starting with verse 20. Some Greeks were among those who had gone to Jerusalem to worship during the festival. Now, this is, this is the final Passover weekend. Jesus is going to be dead in two or three days. They went to Philip. He was from Bethsaida, in, in, in Bethsaida probably in Galilee, and said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and the two of them went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has now come for the Son of Man to receive great glory. I am telling you the truth, a grain of wheat remains no uh, more than a single grain unless it drops. It is dropped into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Those who love their life will lose it, but those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me so that my servant will be with me where I am and my father will honor anyone who serves me. Now Jesus is talking to who? In that brief conversation? His two disciples. Yeah, the ones that came to tell him about the His two disciples. Now my heart is troubled and what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, do not let this honor, this hour come upon me? And what hour is he talking about? The Gethsemane, the crucifixion, the Calvary experience. But that is why I came, so that I might go through this hour of suffering. Father, bring glory to your name. So now, why is Jesus all of a sudden talking about this? I mean, here's a couple of Greeks show up. Now, who do you suppose these Greeks were? Let's talk about that for just a second. There's a couple of options. One option is that they were Jews who had now lived in Gentile ter Greek territory for so long that they spoke only Greek. The other option is that these are actually Greeks that had been converted to become Jews. We're not sure. We don't know. Um, and so what happens next? Then a voice spoke from heaven. I have brought glory to it and I will do so again. The crowd standing there heard the voice, and some of them said it, it was thunder, while others said an angel spoke to him. But Jesus said to them, now he's talking to the crowd, right? It was not for my sake that this voice spoke, but for yours. Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. And saying this, he indicated the kind of death he was going to suffer. Why did that happen? What was what was God trying to accomplish through that? Get people's attention. Okay. Well, it's interesting to remember, yes. Was <laughs> verse 33, in saying this, he indicated the kind of death he was going to suffer. Is that why he said it, or was it to state the reality that I will draw the whole universe to me. Or both. Well, the lifted up statement is he, he made all the way back uh, uh, to, um, who, 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 who did he meet at night? Nicodemus. 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 Yeah, Nicodemus. I mean, uh, he used that same phrase. He, he used it, as I remember, several times throughout his ministry. So that was not a unique. Mm -hmm. No, no. It's interesting, and I'd like to point this out. If you're reading a King James Version, it will say, 
I will bring, I will draw all men to me. But the men is not italics. What does that mean? It was added. It was added. The word men is not there. Why, and would, that, they, why would they do that? Why would they add it? Right, they think they're... Because that's how they understood it. They think they're explaining how it should have been. In yeah. fact, the general editor of this particular version that I have, he chose that verse as an example of how Bible translators work. And I raised my hand at the back of the room and I said, maybe it would have been better if they left the word men out. And then it would have been more in keeping with Paul, what Paul said in Colossians 1, 19 and 20 and Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, that Jesus' death was to bring peace to the beings in the heavenly places as well as this earth. And it went over like a lead balloon yeah. because they, they didn't understand the paradigm I was, yeah. I was coming from. Yeah. Ellen White made this very interesting statement in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 68, paragraph 2. But the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. Does that have something to do with the mission of Jesus? To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. You know, this is... Um, Notice he left the word men out. This is... a. Uh, this is a very unique concept among Christianity. We often talk about things that make uh, Seventh-day Adventists different from other religions. There are other religions that, many, several religions that celebrate Sabbath. There's others who do vegetarianism and, and, and other things. But I don't know of any other um, group of people that have this kind of a, yeah. a, a, a central theme to their theology that this is not just about this tiny little world that and there uh, this is a this is this is not a global thing this is a this is a cosmic situation here this is a very unique yeah a very unique thing and I would say that there are only a small percentage of Seventh-day Adventists who have that view as well yes well, this is, as you know, one of my favorite quotations. Uh, I'm not even done with it yet. <laughs> yeah, well, there's, there is a great deal of theology yes. uh, in, in this one paragraph. Yes. Uh, the revelation of Satan, uh, uh, the purpose uh, for his coming, uh, um, and, and all, of those, all of those reasons. But what do, what do we as, as Christians do uh, with, with the death of Christ? We, we, we make it a... A, a, a blood sacrifice for, for, for God, and uh, we could spend the next hour talking about about that. More longer than that. Yes. Well, <laughs> uh, but we as Seventh Day Adventists hang on to that Christian explanation of the cross. Uh, you mean the pagan Christian explanation? Thank, Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> yes, yes, that that pagan idea of a blood sacrifice, and we have been given this explanation, such uh, such a an enlightened explanation for the cross. Yet we generally seem now. This is my Im impression, my understanding. We generally want want to want to hide this to. to disregard it, to, to sweep it under the carpet. We don't want to seem like we're different than anybody else. Well, I didn't say that. I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but, I mean, that's, that's, th there is a whole paradigm difference uh -huh. uh, that, that this paragraph and there, points out. yeah, points Very out. Clearly. And it is, it is one of the tenets of the 28 the 28 doctrines in, in the book. It's number eight. Uh, w w now, we don't deny it, but if you listen to a sermon, a sermon will, 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 will generally have one f phrase. 
you know, uh, that Jesus won the great controversy. And that's as far as it goes. Now, it doesn't have anything to do with their sermon, but they can at least say they have preached the great controversy. And, and, it, and, and it somehow soothes their conscience, you know. Um, but it's not a central idea of what happened at the cross. Yeah. I, may, I, may I continue? The act of Christ in dying, because I'm going to pick up where you just dropped off, the act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his Son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the results of sin. And where it says the salvation of man back there, we could substitute the word heal Mm -hmm. about the heal of the thinking of man mm -hmm. about God. Yeah. And uh, this idea of a blood sacrifice or a pagan sacrifice. What? What is those things done? Those things are done to change the mind of, of a deity. Mm -hmm. And the, in James 1, 13, it says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. But each person is tempted when he is desire, and enticed by his own desire. God cannot be tempted, and God tempts no one. Mm -hmm. We think we're going to change God's... What can we possibly do to change God's mind? Mm -hmm. You can't do it. God, he knows the, everything. He does, it, it, How does all that reveal, reveal sin, though? Well, last week we talked more about that, but just let me say it once again. And there's a huge amount of stuff that goes behind this, but basically Jesus calls on us to follow his example and live lives the way he did, as close as possible to what he did. If we don't, we will die the kind of death which he died. That's how sin is revealed there? What, we, what way is, Sin is revealed by the fact that Jesus did not die of crucifixion, he did not die of beating, he did not die of his crown of thorns, he did not die of any of those, any of those things we talk about. He died of sin. That's my question. What is the sin? What is sin that causes that, all that stuff to happen? I'm not sure if, uh, well, we're obviously speaking sin, somehow. You said that I'm saying, sin uh, well, causes all this yeah. to happen. Okay. What, Isaiah what 59. What is it that in sin that makes all this happen? Okay. Isaiah 59, verse 2, and a lot of other places, but especially that, says very clearly, sin separates us from God. God is the only source of life. If to put it really simply, God is the only source of life. If you cut off yourself from the only source of life, you're dead. And that's God handing you over or letting you go, Romans 1 and, and several mm -hmm. Psalms and so forth. God lets you let go. And when you're separated from God, you, from the source of life. When you're separated from the source of life, you're not alive. Yeah. Well, the way I understand it, and I'm sure this is a minority of opinion, is that, is that God treated Jesus as if he were a sinner. Mm-hmm. If he'd been a sinner, uh, it, it wouldn't be a demonstration. He, he would he would be dead forever. That's right. Uh, so he treated him as if he were a sinner. This was a demonstration yeah. for our benefit. Mm -hmm. Demonstration that he had not lied back in the garden. Mm -hmm. And this this is the, the, not the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, the Garden of Eden. Thank you, the Garden of Eden. That's right. Satan's accusation. Uh, so. In, in, in demonstrating that the sinner will die, Jesus apparently here is dying the second death. Mm -hmm. He's dying the death in which the Father is involved. So God is treating a person badly now because of the sin. He's, well, you have to be careful with that. Uh, but I believe we can, can look at this experience and apply it to the lake of fire, the second death of the wicked. And um, uh, I, th I, think, I think people would, would like to argue with me, but um, that's, uh, that's how I see it. What's the text that he was made to be sin, though there was no sin in him? What text is that? First Corinthians 5, uh, was it? 
I've forgotten exactly the verse. This well, people that are crucified is, the cross, are bad people. I mean, that's how you get made into the Or Second sin, Corinthians. Isn't it? It might be Second Corinthians, but, but but that's that that I look at think of it as as that's the first death that we see, what Satan and his followers were doing to Christ. Look closely at the story, uh, to understand what God's involvement in the story is, and, and there are three three things that I that I look at, that Jesus was dying back in the Garden of Gethsemane that he fell to the ground dying, that he was bleeding through the pores of his skin. Uh, that was, was before the Romans ever touched him. Secondly, on the cross, wh what did Jesus say? It's, it's wh 21. Yeah. Why, 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 why have you abandoned me? Mm -hmm. so, so God seems to have somehow been involved. And thirdly, he died in hours instead of days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This, okay. This, this, this paragraph here, <clears throat> this is a, a phenomenal, really, a phenomenal paradigm shift mm -hmm. in, in ancient and modern Christian thinking. It's true. Absolutely. And that statement was what, what about what, uh, January 20, 1890. And just a few years before, Ellen White wrote some stuff that was really very pagan in, in our concept uh, that uh, Dennis has uh, found here. So yeah, well, one of these days we'll bring those up. Yeah, it's amazing that the, the shift that she had, the growth that she had over her her lifespan, and and was a lot of it in the about eighteen eighty eight and following is when she really picked up steam. Yeah, um, I'm sorry we don't have time to go there, but. Let, let's go back to uh, Jesus. Look at Matthew 8, verses 11 and 12. I assure you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Where did the Greeks come from? Which direction? What? North. North. No, not primarily west. Primarily west. Who came to see Jesus when he was born? The east. The wise from the east. The wise man from the east. Now he's saying what? I assure you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast in the kingdom of heaven. Hmm. But those who should be in the kingdom will be thrown out into the darkness where they will cry and grind their teeth. Then Jesus said to the officer, and so we'll go and believe what's over this. Does that tell us anything? Could strangers and foreigners, even those relatively ignorant of scriptural truth, be admitted in our place to the heavenly feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Do we know how to explain Adventist doctrines in a winsome, convincing manner to those who might ask about them? The death of Christ on the cross, we've talked a little bit about that, was not only for the benefit of all humans, but also for the benefit of the entire universe. We are all God's children. Those of us on this planet are all sinners, but we are still all God's children. Given that we recognize that we are part of God's universal family, is there any basis for thinking that we are somehow superior ethnically, socially, financially, or culturally to others of God's children. Here's God's uh, uh, God up here, and we're down here. And even if we are a little bit better educated or more financially capable than than some others in the world, I mean, what's the, compared to us versus God, and us versus them? It's like that and this, right? And I'm, I'm not even representing it far enough, I'm sure. So it might be easy for those of us living in the Western world to think of ourselves as educationally and theologically more advanced than some in other parts of the world. But compared to angels, where do we stand? We will spend the rest of eternity learning more details about the plan of salvation, about God's love and what it means to be a part of God's family. What we might know now is a mere drop in the bucket. It certainly is not a basis for being proud. In fact, the church on this world is supposed to be a witness to the rest of the universe. 
Maybe I should read that because a lot of people think, what? You can't, that can't be true. I'm going to read verses 9 and 10. And of making all people see, Paul th thought this was his job, of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be made, put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. How are the angels supposed to learn something more about God? They observe what's going on on this earth. Observe what's going on among us here on planet earth. How many of us have regular opportunities to witness across cultural barriers? Well, not everybody lives in California. I can tell you that about half of my work every day is with people who hardly speak English. So I have opportunity to do that. Um, but everybody has a chance to talk to somebody. I mean, across barriers? What about if you're a doctor and you're talking to a plumber? Is that a barrier? What if you're a teacher and you're speaking to a gardener? Is that a barrier? There have been many examples of missionaries trying to witness across cultural and linguistic barriers, making mistakes that seriously misrepresented the gospel. There's some very hilarious ones, but some not so funny. Clearly, Jesus is calling us to a challenging mission. Why do you think some of those, these non-Jewish people, such as a centurion and the woman of Sidon, were able to develop such faith when the Jews seemed to be slow, so slow to do so? Clearly, God worked with the Jewish people. We know about that all through the Old Testament. Truthfully, do you think the people of Africa, India, and China will ever be able to hear the full truth of the gospel that we have available to us? Well, there are people, every one of us needs to find ways to reach out, to try to reach people, even people who think differently, act differently, are different professionally than we are. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to find the very best possible ways to reach people. We need to try to reach them as they are, not as we are. We don't have the right to say, you need to become like me before you can be a Christian. That was one of the huge mistakes that the Jews make, and we should never make it. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this privilege we have of trying to represent you the best we can. We ask that the words that we have spoken may, be, may touch some lives, may inspire some thinking, and lead people closer to you is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.